I don't seem to be getting any audio. There we go. Okay, I was having, it was not one to unmute me. So, hey, Kurt and Alyssa, um, we were just sort of checking on who was gonna be here, not be here. Um, Sailor wanted to record because she's at a doctor's appointment and is uh, there running late. Um, so I, we can have, we can do one of two things. We can either go ahead and have our conversation about this chapter, or as I was telling Carolyn, this chapter is pretty brief. Uh, it could just kind of roll into the next one. Um, or we could, we could take, I think we could probably do this in maybe 30 minutes. Um, and then, then let y'all go on about your day. I mean, any preferences on your part? Unmute. I, I'm okay. <laughs> I'm okay. I mean, with whatever we decide, none. Of, I think we'll we'll be here next week. I will be. So okay. All right. Um, this is uh, so. Let's just um, let me open this with some prayer. And rather than me reading my way through the chapter, um, maybe let's just have some conversation about what happens, and we'll see kind of how that how that unfolds. Um, and then we'll, we'll move on to next time and we can, we're recording, right? Karen? Yes. Yeah. So we can just go ahead and send that to Sailor and she'll sort of be up and then we'll be ready for what happens when we have, you know, hearing number three, uh, <laughs> <laughs> next, next week, once he gets to, to Caesarea. So, uh, the Lord be with you. Also, let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks uh, for the beauty of this spring and for the promise of new life that you continually put in front of us. In all things, when ways seem to be closed as they may have seemed to fall, we know that you open the way. We pray for you to open our eyes, and hearts, and minds in this time together as we look into scripture and to Give us the hope of new life and new ways of being. All these things we ask in the name of your Son, Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay. So um, just to, to kind of return us to where we were last time. Um, Paul has been urged um, by James to undergo that purification ritual and then present himself in the temple, which he did. And that didn't turn out too well, <laughs> since there was then a riot. Um, and the tribune, right, hearing trouble there from his little, basically what was just kind of a fortified police station, uh, there outside the temple, uh, came in and broke things up and rescued Paul. Uh, and then uh, where we pick up with today, um, the Tribune's idea was that uh, perhaps the best way to get to the bottom of things was to go to the Sanhedrin, since this seemed to be an issue that pertained to them and not necessarily strictly to them, although he was charged with keeping things in hand in the temple precinct. So where we pick up today is at that exchange with the Sanhedrin. And as you know, um, things don't go swimmingly there. Uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll get into, into why. But let me just say a couple of things about one way of of thinking about where Paul is in this scene. His um, position here in, in this moment in Jerusalem presents him, and we, we touched on this, but maybe not in these terms. He's poised between the two extremes there in what some scholars call pre-war Jerusalem, right? Because we know 
And Jesus had spoken of this, um, and we know from history, from Josephus and many others, um, that obviously there's going to be a war in AD 66, and Paul is there not terribly long before that, some 20 years after Jesus' own appearance in front of the Sanhedrin, and lots of other things have happened. Um, but the things that Jesus predicted in terms of the destruction of the temple uh, and the, the dispersion, once again, of, of Jewish authority, is that's, that's coming. And Paul is, is kind of in, the, in he's Mr. In Between, right? On the one hand, you've got these rioting zealots, right, who are in the temple precincts and in the streets. And then on the other hand, You've got the Jewish authorities represented by the high priests and the Sanhedrin who are essentially corrupt right, uh, and dealing with the Roman occupiers, right? So those forces are struggling against one another. And then you've got Paul, right, who's neither on the one hand nor on the other. And we see him being torn. Um, and really fortunate, and we can talk about this, um, that God is able to use uh, the conscience and the authority of, of some good Romans who are trying to do their job uh, in order to accomplish what God needs to accomplish. So since the Tribune has seen that there's no hope of getting a rational answer out of the temple crowd in the middle of that brief, uh -huh, um, he needs to get Paul examined by the Sanhedrin. It's not a trial per se, right? but it is almost like a grand jury, except there's not an indictment that comes. They're gathering information, right? And he wants to, to, to learn you know, what's the real argument about. And is Paul really guilty of what they say, although he suspects not? And by the time we get to the end of this chapter, we'll know a little bit more about where the Tribune's mind comes down on these things. So the Sanhedrin is a ruling council of Judea at the time, and it's the only native body that the Roman government can do business with. And so that is the logical, indeed the only place, that the Tribune can take Paul to be examined. So there are a couple of effects uh, on Luke's readers that um, are enacted by this moment in front of the Sanhedrin. On one hand, and, and these are obvious, it brings up all the parallels with Jesus and his trial, right? And in this season of our life together in church, we're about to walk into that moment, you know? Uh, and our gospel lessons on Sundays in Lent are progressively taking us closer and closer uh, to that encounter in Jesus' life. But the second thing that this scene does is it gives Paul a second attempt to make what we call an apologia. In other words, um, a defense speech in front of these people to speak for himself and see what he has to say what they have to say about it. And he's doing that in front of the very same people who 20 years before uh, had such an impact on the original apostles and on Jesus himself. One last word before we get into some questions. It says high priests, just to clarify. There is only one at a time. However, uh, like bishops in the church <laughs> and some other authorities, after they serve their term and are retired, they retain their title, their authority, their seat, and their voice, right? So there's not just one high priest, there's all the ones who remain, right? Who are also there in front of the Sanhedrin. Also present, and you hear this from Paul's lips, are Pharisees, but also Sadducees, right? And you no doubt have some sense of of who they are. Um, and I don't want to over-determine who they are in our contemporary term. The Sadducees are basically very, very conservative and very literal in their approach to scripture. They do not believe in the resurrection. Pharisees, on the other hand, 
um, did believe that God was continuing to reveal God's self and God's will in the world. And the real question for Paul is, is that going to include the apostolic witness to Christ himself as a revelation or a continuing unveiling of God and God's will? And that's the question. Um, but we don't ever quite get to that question. Right in, in the reading that we're looking at today. So when Paul ends up in front of the council, let's talk about, first of all, let's say something about Ananias, okay, since I'm on my little history today. Um, you remember him, right? Remember he turned up in, um, in the in Luke's account of the trial of Jesus, right? Um, Ananias is the high priest. Right, and, and Jesus gets brought before him. He had a reputation for being um, uh, extremely authoritarian, right? and also for um, being very wealthy and also corrupt. And just to tell you where things are going, he is assassinated by those in his own party who turned against him uh, in the events of AD 66. So his, his days are in fact numbered, um, but he is an ambivalent figure and he's ambivalent for Paul himself. And also we've got to remember for Lewis readers as they encountered him at the very beginning. On the one hand, he's the highest and holiest authority in all of Judaism. And on the other hand, he's known widely to be penal and corrupt. So there you have it. He's quite a guy. So um, turning to chapter 23, and let's start um, in verse 6, okay, when Paul appears. Um, when Paul noticed that some of the Sadducees, well, let me, let's go back. Let's, we, I'm missing a whole big important thing. Let's go back to, um, that's actually where I want to start the first one. While Paul was looking intently at the council, he said, brothers, up to this day, I have lived my life with a clear conscience before God. Two things in that one statement that he's trying to accomplish. What what do you think they are? Huh? Common brothers. Common brothers. Yeah, yeah, Kurt. Well, are you saying he he was saying that he was a good Jew and and they should leave him alone? <laughs> That's exactly it. He, he he is saying, yes, I am a good Jew, right? And I have followed the law and I've done nothing wrong. And he also, as Carolyn pointed out, addresses them as brothers so that he puts himself on a level with them right, as one of them, right? And he's attempting to explain himself within their context, right? Um, and let's take it on down to Ananias. Then the high priest Ananias ordered those standing near him to strike him on the mouth. At this, Paul said to him, God will strike you, you whitewashed wall. Which is the, and that's the back of that corruption thing. Are you sitting there to judge me according to the law, and yet in violation of the law, you order me to be struck? How is that a violation of the law? I don't know. Well, well it still kind of is. <laughs> He's got to be allowed to defend himself. Yeah. So before he can speak, they, and I have to admit, since we live in the present moment, the Oscars were Sunday night, it calls to mind slap, right? <laughs> <laughs> and then what happens? I mean, the effect of that is what? So you're calling me a lawbreaker when you're a lawbreaker. Well, but then it's, we're right back where we were. Right? I mean, right. you slap somebody in front of a group of people and everybody's just going to go oh, wild. 
nuts. Yeah. So that, so we're kind of right back there. And of course, now remember the Tribune sitting outside listening. Okay. So all of that. Okay. Um, Let's go down to verse four. Those standing nearby said, Do you dare insult God's high priest? And Paul said, I did not realize, brothers, that he was a high priest. For it is written, You shall not speak evil of a leader of your people. So then Paul looks around the room and he noticed that some were Sadducees and others were Pharisees. And he called out in the council, Brothers, I am a Pharisee, a son of Pharisees. I am on trial concerning the hope of the resurrection of the dead. When he said this, a dissension began between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. Okay, and then Luke explains to us that the Sadducees don't believe in the resurrection of the dead. So, I don't know if you tell me, is Paul being smart? <laughs> or is he just doing the best he can? Uh, is he just turning insult into injury? What, what's he doing? That sounds well, like he was trying to put them, pit them against each other. Well, that ends up being the effect, for sure, yeah. He was pretty bold. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> I, well, I think he's making a play for the Pharisees, right? I mean, yeah. he looks out there and he says, I, I know the Sadducees are not going to go for me, okay? So the best hope I've got is to try to pitch myself over the high priest, right? Mm -hmm. And pass the Sadducee to the other Pharisees and hope that they'll give me a listen, right? And, and, and believe. And then, then the, you know, the thing he says, though, is like throwing the match on the fire, Right? He said, I've come to testify to the resurrection of the dead. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'm going to testify to one thing that they don't believe in, but he is accomplishing his mission, right? Yeah. Jesus, God, God came to him and said, I'm going to be strong because I'm going to be here with you. Well, after this, that's after this. Oh, that's true. Sorry. Sorry. Um, the resurrection of the dead in this case is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Oh, yeah. right? So he is giving testimony to the apostolic witness, yeah. which is that Christ was risen from the dead. So he, he's, he's being clear and fair and forthcoming about his argument, but he's also um, intentionally or not maybe unavoidably being incendiary. Right. One of the things that N.T. Wright, the question that he asked in his study book, um, it says, um, does Paul get to the heart of the issue while once again showing himself to be wise as a serpent and innocent as a dove in dealing with the political powers at work? I thought. I mean, then maybe he does. Wise as a serpent and innocent as a dove. Um, he's a smart guy. I didn't get the question until we talked about it now. I thought, well, maybe, maybe so. <laughs> uh, he, he, he's been trained, okay, essentially as a lawyer. Right? So he knows what he's doing. Um, but he also can look around the room and say, <laughs> I'm doomed. Right? He can read the room. <laughs> Things don't look good for him. But at you least know, if I came here to testify to the truth, that's what I'm going to do. Yeah, Kurt? I think he was also knowing that the Romans were listening and probably thinking, you know, this is just a bunch of hooey that between the Jews, you know, and why should we be, you know, why should we let them do anything to a Roman citizen? There is that too. I mean, he, he's got that in his back pocket and he knows that they're right outside the door. And in fact, um, that's, that's pretty much where we're about to go really fast. So the outburst though has the effect of splitting them in two, right? And then when the tribune hears it, he steps in. Right. And so you know, the last thing in the world the tribune wants is for a, a real riot to break out inside the Jewish court 
and this place is supposed to be under his protection, and then that's that's not good for him in any way. Um, so so let's let's skip over the little editorial comment about the Sadducees. Um, and middle of verse nine, um, the Pharisees group stood up, the scribes of the Pharisees group stood up and said, we find nothing wrong with this man. What if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him? And when the dissension became violent, right? So that kind of stirs the pot a little more. The tribune, fearing that they would tear Paul to pieces, ordered the soldiers to go down, take him by force, and bring him into the barracks. And then we go to that night. The Lord stood near him and said, keep up your courage, for just as you have testified for me in Jerusalem, so you must bear witness also. Right? And then things, the plot thickens uh, in, in the next set of verses after that. So it is interesting. Um, and, and once again, I think this is echoes of, of Jesus' experience and also of his own prophecy um, to his disciples. It's precisely at the moment of maximum confusion, right? And it's exactly in the darkness uh, when things are dangerous and when things are unstable and when Paul is possibly in doubt about his loss of status and his eating his person. It's in that moment, Luke tells us that the Lord stood by him right, and gave him that word. So I, I guess I'm, Paul, yes, he's filled with bravado. He's very self-assured. He's extremely confident in his mission and his ministry. But sometimes, especially, right? You stepped out there. You said what you needed to say. You did what you needed to do. But then, in the middle of the night, okay, you wake up and you think, "Well, were all those people right who counseled me not to go to Jerusalem?" Right? And he said, if you go to Jerusalem, it's all over for you. Yeah. And is it? Were they right? And then you think, is this the faith that God has for me? Right? Have I been brought here to become another martyr? Another example. And then also, I might be thinking, if I were Paul, did James have this all figured out when he said this ritual thing was a good idea? I mean, that whole, that, but let's go back and let's think about James and maybe that was not such a good idea to send me to the temple to do that because that started all over. So we're in the middle of the night and it's like, maybe this just didn't work out the way it was supposed to. But that's when you need the, the message, right? The message. Um, and we're told that the Lord stood by. Is it a dream? It might be. But that's a message too. Okay? Um, we're not told that it's an angel. We're told that it's the Lord himself. Um, it's, uh, it's reassurance, but it's also heard a song I mean, which, that I really kind of like. Fuck up. Right? Um, you got to, don't give up now. Pull yourself together, know that it's not over, and that there's going to be another ring, right? So you got to be ready to put the you know, very metaphor to its sad conclusion. You got to be ready to come out swinging the next time. Mm -hmm. um, and that's that's really what God has got to so, well, so he's, he's, yeah, go ahead, Kurt. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying he's he's telling him he's got to go to Rome, so he knows that he's not going to get, you know, martyred there. Right. It's not going to come apart here. It might not might come apart in Rome, but you got to go to Rome. Yeah. So that's you got to pull yourself together. 
So now the plot thickens. If things weren't bad enough in the dark dungeon of the nighttime, in the daytime, what we've got out, and this should remind us of Jesus too, is we've got the zealots out there uh, making a pact. But all right, plotting an ambush, right? right? We know they've got to move him out of the Antonia at some point. And when they do, we're going to kill him, right? This is vigilante justice, right? It's the, it's the rule of the mob, right? It's, a, it's the lynching mentality, right? Um, we're not going to trust this to the authorities. We're just going to take care of this ourselves. But it helps me to maybe imagine that um, you've got all these young people and you've got these real forces of unrest in the streets. And this happens all over the world, right? I mean, it happens in all sorts of political contexts, which is what this was. But everybody who's out there in the street is not necessarily of one mind. So it just so happens that as these people are making their plot, who's listening? Little boy. <laughs> Who also happens to be? Son oh. of oh. Oh, Paul's, yeah. Paul's, Paul's sister. Nephew. Paul's nephew, yeah. yeah. So he hears about it and he basically spills the beans, right? Um, so he takes himself to the tribune and says, so, so here's the deal. This is really pretty cool. Um, God says everything's going to be great, and then things get worse, and then you think, okay, so how are you going to work this out? Okay. So step one, you've got something that looks like it might be a disaster. Step two, you've got the nephew who happens to be in the middle of it. Step three, he comes back to the tribune, right? And, and let's look at that because now we're kind of into the psychology of this guy, which is actually pretty interesting. So um, down about, okay, 19 or so, the tribune took him by the hand, this is the boy, and pulled him aside and said privately, what is it you have to report to me? And he answered, the Jews have agreed to ask you to bring Paul down to the council tomorrow and don't be persuaded because there are about 40 of them and they've made a pact um, that they're not gonna eat or drink or do anything else until they kill Paul. So the tribune, dismissed the young man, ordering him, tell no one that you've informed me of this. Then he summoned two of the centurions and said, get ready to leave by nine o'clock tonight for Caesarea with 200 soldiers, 70 horsemen, and 200 spearmen. Also provide mounts for Paul to ride and take him safely to Felix the governor. And he wrote a letter to this effect. Okay, well, let's go ahead and read the letter because then we'll back up to his precautions. Claudius Lysias, so now we know his name, to his excellency, the governor Felix. Greetings. This man was seized by the Jews and was about to be killed by them. But when I had learned that he was a Roman citizen, I came with the guard and rescued him. Since I wanted to know the charge for which they accused him, I had him brought to their council. I found that he was accused concerning questions of their law but was charged with nothing deserving death or imprisonment. When I was informed that there would be a plot against this man, I sent him to you at once, ordering his accusers also to stand before you with what they have against him. So the soldiers, according to his instructions, take note of him. So very carefully worded the letter. Um, what's going on in Claudius Silicius's mind? He doesn't want him to be killed on his watch. Don't want him killed on my watch. Kick the problem be... down the road. <laughs> yeah, kick the problem down the road. Um, take him to the next level up. You don't want to riot, right? 
in your spot. I mean, you don't want your station destroyed. Um, he has the resources to get this guy out of town safely. So really all he's done is he hasn't excluded the Sanhedrin. He just says, y'all need to go to Caesarea and appear in front of Felix. Because there, there are Roman forces in sufficient number handle a riot. You write a full blown riot, which is what he fears they're going to have once, and especially once they you know get a taste for blood. And he also lays out the case very clearly. That I was putting down a potential insurrection. I really could not find anything against the law that he did, but there may be a charge that the Jews wish to pursue. I don't know, but he cannot safely be tried here. Um, and then, and that's pretty impressive. I mean, he's got 200 soldiers, 70 horsemen, and 200 spearmen. He's got 470 people. He didn't think he had enough people to <laughs> some. I don't know. I don't know how big this crowd is, right? And it's in Jerusalem. Oh, so it's, it's a big city. Yeah. He must have thought it was pretty serious. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, honestly, he doesn't want to have to deal with it. No. Um, and, and get it out of town if he can and take it to the Roman center, right? And put it there. I mean, get these people off their turf and onto our turf so that we stand a better chance of not losing anything in this. He does, to Paul's advantage, make very clear that Paul's a Roman, he's a Roman citizen. And therefore, Claudius is fulfilling his obligation to protect citizens of Rome by protecting Paul. He's not just protecting some random Jew. Um, but, and he is innocent under Roman law. So his accusers are going to have to come in front of the full forces of Rome in order to make their case, which is really where we leave things at the end of this chapter. So I mean, it's really pretty interesting. I mean, and maybe a little heavy on the history this time, um, but it, it, it does open up. The way, we tend to think of, of God as external to history, right? That God sort of hovers outside of history in events. Um, and, and then even sometimes, uh, I think in Christian terms, like, well, the guy in the Old Testament, he really got involved in the day-to-day -day events of real people. And the guy in the New Testament, he doesn't do that. But that's not, that's not what we see. Here. I mean, we see the unfolding of, of God's plans for the redemption of the world, right, in the midst of political turmoil and strife and the decisions that individual people have to make and conscience and violence and truth and adherence to justice and all of those things get wrapped up with it. Um, and it really start thinking about, you know, how, how have we seen that when we we're all of a certain age in, in our life? Um, plenty of things that we can point to within, within our own historical experience. Um, and I think that's, that's just worthy of pause, um, that, that the Acts of the Apostles is, is preparing us for, Paul is preparing us for. You guys have, have thoughts about those things? I, I've always wondered how Paul proved he was a citizen. I mean, he could stand up there and say, I'm a Roman citizen, but I mean, why would they take his word for it? Well, I guess he said by birth, I guess if they really wanted to know they could go search their records because they took a census. Yeah, I guess so. Did they have That's right. <laughs> I read something about that and they were saying, you know, like if he had been hard pressed to pull out anything, if he had to, yeah. but it's just like, if you're inside a country, people assumed you had a passport to get in. <laughs> there's that. Yeah, and there's that. So they were saying maybe it was just assumed because mm -hmm. he was born and he was there 
that was not an issue. They just I don't know, took it for granted. And he does know the laws. I mean, he knows he's a lawyer. He does know the law. Um, he does speak well of himself. Um, we are kind of in the innocent until proven guilty world uh, with that. And, and you're right, nobody's carrying around their credentials. Yeah. Um, so the, the appearances would lead them to believe that he is telling the truth. Um, it's not really worth their while to go dig it up. I mean, it might become worth their while at some point to go dig it up. I guess if you said you were a citizen, they found out you weren't, it would have gone bad for you. Yeah, it probably would. And on the other hand, if you said you were a citizen, you didn't believe somebody and things went south and then it turned out that you were and they didn't protect you, then things are not good for them. Yeah. So I think that's really where Claudius is in his head. Right. This guy said he's a citizen. I've got to protect him because if something happens to him and he is, then it's on me. Right. And I don't want that on me. And that's an echo from Jesus's trial as well, Pontius Pilate. Right. I'm washing my hands of this. I don't want anything to do with this. One. Okay. He hasn't broken a Roman law. I'm going to turn him over to you guys and whatever y'all decide to do, whatever. But then there's the Barabbas thing, but we're getting off of it. So, okay. Well, anything else? Anything, Alyssa, does NT Wright offer us uh, some, some nuggets of wisdom? Uh, uh, no, I don't think so. Um, I will say that I thought the history lesson was really interesting because I never knew that about the beliefs of the Pharisees and the Sadducees and it, you know, it still continues with the split and how people think, you know, and it just reminds me of the riot of January 6th when I'm envisioning this, this is, was 40, but I still envision that same kind of thing. Uh, the one thing that um, N.T. writes that he throws these little things in that don't necessarily have, anyway, they're, they're just questions and he's it has this quote it says um when uh when you pray uh, coincidences happen when mm -hmm. you don't pray they don't happen and that was just kind of at the end of the chapter thing so um i that was one of his food for thought things you know that's funny because <laughs> um just this weekend, when I was working on my sermon, and I was reading something that had nothing to do directly with the sermon itself, but it had to do with, um, with the idea of synchronicity. Um, and, and the relationship of meditation and prayer to synchronicity. Um, which may simply be putting us in a position of paying attention more closely, yeah. right? Uh, or of, of, of changing the focus of our awareness in such a way that we're able to see some things that we might otherwise ignore, right? Uh, but the whole question of, of prayer, that, um, and that is, in fact, a quotation from somebody else, and I'll have to go dig it up. I can't, I can't remember who it is. Oh, I don't know what it is. It's William Temple. It's Archbishop William Temple. Yes. Who's, yes. <laughs> That's who's, right. <laughs> I get there. Who said, when I pray, coincidences happen. And when I'm not praying, they don't. Right. And that, and what I was reading was saying, you know, when, when you're in that the mindset of prayer or meditation, you are open to those things. And, and if you're not, then you're not open to those things. Um, which, and. Isn't that what the Enneagram is trying to get you to do? Is to well, get there, into that. To be aware of your, of your own personality. And to get, get you to that place. Yeah. And then awareness is the, is the thing. Um, but but the, the idea of prayer, however, um, has to do with the release of, 
of your over-reliance on your conscious awareness. Right. That it's it's not your conscious awareness or your logic or your reason. Uh, it, there, there are other forces at play uh, in the world and in nature. Um, and so this may be elicit a kind of go back to what we're looking at. Um, if Paul is indeed a man of prayer, and certainly he's all alone, okay? He doesn't have anybody else to fall back on. Um, and so it, I think, stands to reason um, that he's, he's of necessity in a place of prayer. Um, so there is that kind of openness, right, to... And the point you bring up is that God's not external, but mm -hmm. it was very close and intimate to Paul. So it was within him and the things he heard were very directly related with God being involved right then and there and right. not something external, which is. Yeah, and God, but, but also to say that, um, yes, God is, is internal and present um, and, and also present in the actions of others. Um, and, and if you think about um, the, the Roman Trinity, right? Not a Christian, not a Jew. But what can God use in that man? I mean, He's using His self protection, but is it not also possible that God is using the very structures of, of human justice and fairness? Um, and the protection of innocent people to accomplish God's purposes. So the people that are not believing. Right. So that it doesn't necessitate that man's belief. But his actions. Yeah. But God is at work in his actions in their inherent rightness and goodness. Does that does that mm -hmm. make sense? So well, a lot to think about in a chapter that just seems to be moving the movie plot along. Um, there's, yeah. there's just a, a lot of stuff happening in the, in the interstices there. So. Well, well, thank y'all. We're, we're a little bit early in getting done. Um, next week, we'll, we'll get on to Felix um, and look at the account there, uh, which is is not what's get terribly long. Um, and then we're, we're moving our way on toward, that is, we are just doing one chapter next time. Yeah, so the courtroom drama is the next time. And then the last two weeks, so we have three more meetings. So there's that for the next one. And then on the 28th, we have chapters 25 and 26. And then on the 4th, we have 27 and 28. So the name is still there. Well, thank y'all and thank you. Uh, thank peace you. and blessings on the rest of your week. And I'll see you next time. All right.